Hi guys, welcome or welcome back. Thank you so much for being here. It's so greatly appreciated, it truly is. Before we start, let me give you my usual disclaimer that this video is for educational purposes only. Please do not take what I say as fact. Please always do your own research and come to your own conclusions. If you have not liked, subscribed, or commented yet, please consider doing so. It really helps me out. I really, really appreciate it. Just always remember to keep it classy in the comment section down below. And with that, let's start. Kenya Monet. She was born on January 26, 1996 in Honduras. Her mother, Maria, was just 15 at the time when she gave birth to her. And understandably, she struggled greatly from having to be such a young mother. Kenya was described as highly intelligent, extremely kind and caring. She made friends easily. She had a warm heart and a fun loving personality. She had a active social life and her favorite thing to do was to spend quality time with her family. In April of 1993, when Kenya was just a little over a year old, Maria left for the United States to try and give her daughter a better life. Kenya would stay back in Honduras with her grandmother and I can't imagine that this was an easy choice for Maria, but I understand why she felt that she needed to come here, I guess, get her, you know, establish herself and then bring her daughter over so that she could give Kenya the life that she deserved. In 1994, Maria would meet and marry a man named Tony Lee. The couple would go on to have two children together, a daughter named Kimberly and a son named Anthony. In 2004, when Kenya was 12 years old, she would finally be able to come to the United States. It was actually very difficult for her at first because she spoke very little English, but she never let that hold her back. Tony loved Kenya like she was his own daughter. And just weeks after moving into the home with her mom and Tony, she would begin calling him dad. She would also bond with her siblings almost immediately, especially Kimberly, and the two would become more like best friends than sisters. Just like so many others in Honduras, Kenya lived in poverty. So when she was given the opportunity to come to the United States, she was determined not to take anything for granted, and she would end up excelling in her high school classes. After graduation, she went on to attend a local community college where she majored in broadcasting. She also moved out and was living with her boyfriend at this time. At this point, Kenya was only 19 years old and she and her friends had fake IDs to gain entry into clubs and to drink. If that is the worst thing that she does, then she's a pretty damn good kid in my opinion. I never had a fake ID. But that is only because I went to bars that didn't check IDs or I would throw hotel parties. So to me, it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal in my eyes that she had a fake ID and she would go to clubs underage and drink. I feel like, I know, maybe it's the unpopular opinion, but I feel like it's a rite of passage as a teenager. I did it. I did it too. Point being, it's, you know, it's not a big deal. She was never in trouble with the law. She was a very good kid. She was a responsible kid, and she had, she got great grades. March 31st, 2011, Kenya and her friends decided to go out to a club called 24K Lounge in downtown Denver. It's not exactly clear how Kenya ended up outside of the club, but somehow she ended out, she ended up outside, alone and intoxicated without her purse, her keys, or her cell phone. The following morning, after Kenya failed to come home, her family would find out that she had not gone out with her typical group of friends. She had gone out with a different group of friends that night who were not like, I guess, well aware of how Kenya acted while she was out drip drinking. So although that's understandable, I feel like whether you know someone's bar behavior or not, 
alarm bells should go off immediately when your friend disappears without her phone, her purse, or her keys, because these are essential items. She has to have these things. Kenya's boyfriend, Lewis, would also become extremely concerned when he woke up and saw that Kenya hadn't come home and hadn't called. Kenya always came home, and if she wasn't going to come home, she would have absolutely communicated that to him. So he decides to call Kenya's sister and let her know what's going on. When Kimberly told Lewis that she hadn't heard from Kenya either, he told her to call her parents to see if they have heard anything. When Kimberly told her parents what was going on, they rushed home from work and began calling everybody that they knew to find out any sort of information that they could. Kenya's close group of friends told them that she'd spent the night out with other friends and that they hadn't heard from her. The group of friends that Kenya was with that night went over to Lee and Maria's home to answer any kind of questions that they may have. That's when they told them that they had gone into the 24K nightclub with the fake IDs and that the last time they saw her was just after midnight. The girls also handed over Kenya's purse, phone, and keys, telling them that she left it at the table with them. And it was at that point that Leah and Maria's hearts just sank because they knew that Kenya would never go anywhere without these items. And something bad must have happened. When her parents look through the phone, they find a message from a number that was not saved in the phone. And the message read, Hey, this is Travis, the guy who gave you a ride last night. White creepy van. Did you get home okay? So who is this mystery man? 31-year-old Tony Forbes had a pretty extensive criminal history. When he was 17, he was charged with breaking into 16 different homes and businesses. He was also convicted of two counts of felony burglary and sentenced to nine years in prison. But instead of prison, he was enrolled in a military camp. And I'm thinking that his age played a huge role in this decision. However, he would spend less than two months there before getting kicked out of the camp and being placed on probation. In 1998, he was arrested for criminal harassment while he was still on probation. In 1999, he broke his probation again when he was caught carrying a knife. He would break curfew 43 times while on probation. And in 2004, he was charged with assault when he threw rocks at a woman who was jogging in a park. He pled guilty to the lesser charge of harassment involving physical force and was sentenced to one month in prison. This is part of his problem. He's never actually been punished for the dumb shit that he's done. Tony would call the number repeatedly, hoping to get any sort of answers about Kenya's whereabouts, but Travis wouldn't answer the phone. At that point, his parents decided to go down to the police station and file a missing persons report. They would say that once there, they explained the situation and the officer was very dismissive and very unsympathetic, telling them that she would probably show up soon. Here we go again. Telling them that she would probably show up soon and that they couldn't file a missing persons report until she was missing for 72 hours. Again, unless I've been lied to all of these years, this is not true. There's no set amount of time to report someone missing. This is nothing more. I, I don't think this is anything more than a lazy cop that doesn't want to do his job. But if you're a police officer and I'm wrong, please let me know in the comments below. But I am like 99.999% sure that there's no specific wait time that needs to be met before reporting a person missing. And that is one of the things that gets under my skin so badly because so much can happen in 72 hours, especially missing the opportunity to save someone's life. The following day, Saturday, April 2nd, Travis finally decides to call back Kenya's parents. He tells them that he saw Kenya outside at around 2.30 a.m., talking to a homeless guy. 
He goes on to say that when he asked her if she needed help, she told him that she needed a ride to her car. So she, he said, all right, jump in. And I'll take you to your car. But he says that she couldn't remember where her car was and that they were driving around, but they couldn't find the car. So it was at that point that he offers to drive her home. He goes on to say that while he was taking her home, Kenya asked him to stop for cigarettes. So he does. But she didn't have any money. He said she walked over to a man that was outside smoking a cigarette, asked him for one, smoked, with, smoked it with him, chatted with him, and then walked off with him. And that was the last time that he claims that he saw her. After hanging up the phone with Kyle, Tony calls the police back. He tells them the story and he begs them to file the missing persons report. Their response to him, you have to wait the 72 hours. So at that point, Tony decides to call Travis back and the two men agree to meet at the Conoco gas station, which is the last place that Kenya was seen. Before leaving, Tony grabs his 9mm and then he's off. His wife, Maria, now she's concerned because he's going to meet this strange guy and he grabbed his 9mm. She calls police and she asks them to go down and just make sure that nothing goes wrong. Once there, Travis gets out of the car and he gives him the same account of events that he told him on the phone. Tony would later say that Travis seemed genuine and didn't remind him of a hardened criminal. Unfortunately, though, not all hardened criminals look the same. Something wasn't adding up for Tony or the police officer that was standing there. It made no sense that Kenya would walk off in the middle of the night with some guy she just met at a gas station and bummed a cigarette from. The officer asks Travis if he could take a look inside the van, and Travis says okay. The back of the vehicle is absolutely spotless, and it has brand new carpeting. The front of the car, however, was a complete mess with food wrappers and garbage thrown everywhere. So this definitely raises alarm bells for the officer, but... It's nowhere near enough to bring him into custody over. When they're about to leave, Travis walks up to Tony and he apologizes to him, saying that he wished he had followed through on what he started. Tony thanks him for his help and puts his hand out to shake it. He says that when Travis shook his hand, it was shaking so violently that that's when Tony knew Travis was the last person to see Kenya alive. Okay, I'm back. Sorry, I had to take a break to do mommy things. Okay, Monday, April 4th, 2011. After 72 hours had passed, the police finally decided to begin the investigation into what happened to Kenya. April 5th, 2011. Surveillance footage was given to officers from Debbie's Bakery and Cafe. The footage was from April 1st, and it was of Travis Forbes using their space to bake his gluten-free bars for his business. He would call the bars Forbes and sell them to local businesses. April 6, 2011, Travis was brought into the Denver Police Station for questioning. He would repeat the same story that he had previously told to Tony and the police officer when they met that day at the gas station. He tells the police that after he left the gas station, he drove over to his girlfriend's home, but when detectives checked his phone records, they saw that he was nowhere near his girlfriend's home at that time. Monica Poole, the owner of the bakery space that Travis rented, went to police to tell them that her surveillance cameras had been turned off on April 2nd, the morning after Kenya went missing. The last footage is on April 1st at 7.30 p.m., and it is a video of Travis Forbes alone in the space wearing long latex cleaning gloves. Police would catch Travis in another lie after talking to Monica. 
Travis told police that he left his girlfriend's home for work on April 1st, but Monica told them that he was actually not scheduled to go into work that day. When police viewed the footage from before the cameras were turned off, it showed Travis rolling a cart with a large white cooler on top of it. Cooler was duct taped shut and was being wheeled into the walk-in freezer. Next, he was seen carrying a roll of carpet into the bakery. Then he was seen walking out to his van with a bottle of bleach before the cameras were turned off. Detectives interviewed neighboring business owners. One man told them that he had seen a 55-gallon barrel being burned by two men behind Debbie's Bakery on the evening of April 1st. Another business owner told police that he saw Travis cleaning a large white cooler in the back of his van. When Monica asked Travis what he was burning, he told her that he was burning marijuana that had gotten moldy. Can marijuana get moldy? I didn't know that. He went on to tell her that he turned the cameras off because he was changing his clothing. When she questioned him about a gash on his arm, he told her that it was done by a homeless man while he was sleeping in his van. About a month after Kenya's disappearance, Travis took his friend's car and decided to take off to Austin, Texas. It's not that he couldn't go to Austin, Texas, but it seems rather strange that when you are in the center of a missing persons case, that you would take off. It, it very much looked like police were not buying what he was selling and he decided to go on the run. When police questioned Travis's girlfriend about his whereabouts the night Kenya went missing, she told them that she was with Travis between the hours of 3 a.m. and 8.30 a.m. Only problem is that his cell phone records tell a very different story. According to phone records, Travis was nowhere near his girlfriend's home that evening. He was, in fact, in a town called Keensburg, which is about 40 miles from where he lived. Detectives also discovered that while he was there, he made several phone calls. Police would search all over Keensburg 15 times, actually, within a five-month period. They searched on foot, horseback, and by helicopter. They searched ditches and waterways, but nothing. May 4th, Travis was arrested in Austin on suspicion of car theft. The detective working the case in Colorado actually flew to Texas to meet him. He interviewed Travis for about three hours, filling him in on all the new discoveries that they had made while he was on the run. Detective Gural said he explained everything away, the barrel, the cooler, everything. When officers asked Travis if he slept with Kenya, he clammed up and asked for a lawyer. Detectives said fine, but not before handing him a warrant for his DNA. Sucks to be you, Travis. On June 30th, he was extradited back to Colorado, but since his friend dropped car theft charges, he was let go. After he was released, he returned to his hometown of Fort Collins. This was actually a huge concern for officers because Fort Collins is home to Colorado State University, which houses a lot of female college students. And since he was suspected of a female college student, this was pretty concerning for them, understandably, obviously. Detectives would put round-the-clock surveillance on Travis. After about three days of surveillance, they decided to stop watching him because nothing was really happening. The most that happened was he was being drunk in public and they would end up regret and they would end up regretting this decision for the rest of their lives. 30-year-old Lydia Tillman was originally from Longmont, Colorado. She moved to New York for 6 years to become a sommelier. 
before moving back to Colorado and renting an apartment in Fort Collins. July 4th, 2011, Lydia was walking home to her apartment after watching the fireworks display. What she didn't know was that she was being followed. Travis Forbes pushed Lydia into her apartment. Then he R-worded her and he her. He then punched her in the face, smashed her jaw, causing several causing severe head trauma. Lydia did fight back. She kicked, she scratched, but it, she was just no match for him. Before he left, he doused her body in bleach and he set her apartment on fire. He's such a scumbag. He is such scum. I'm not sure that anyone will ever know how this girl lived other than she had such a strong will to live. But somehow she was able to get up and get out. She threw herself out of the window of her second floor apartment to escape the flames. By the time Lydia jumped, police, fire, and paramedics were there, and she was taken immediately to the hospital. Paramedics asked her if she knew who had done this to her, and she said that she had no idea who had done this to her. Shortly after this, Lydia suffers a stroke and goes into a coma for three weeks. Because of the bleach, there was little to no forensic evidence to work with. They were, however, able to get a very small amount of DNA from under Lydia's fingernails that the police sent off for analysis. In the days following Lydia's attack, police had begun to surveil Travis again. They would watch Travis stalk the streets at night, leering at women, probably looking for his next victim. On July 10th, 2011, officers observed Travis talking to a woman for a good 30 minutes before the two walked off together. Police, fearful of his intentions, stopped the two and asked Travis for his name. He tells them that his name is Travis Kennedy and that he did not have any ID on him. By this point, the woman that he was walking with was long gone, so police just let him go. 20 minutes later, already, 20 minutes later, he reappears back downtown with a new shirt and a hat on. He was following another woman that was very visibly intoxicated, and police knew that they had to get him off the streets at this point. No. Thankfully, they were smart enough to know that they had to get him off the streets at this point. At 3 a.m., they arrest him for lying about his name to police. They never mention anything about Lydia and only hold him on a misdemeanor that he very easily could have bonded out of. On July 11th, 2011, at 10.45 p.m., Travis was just minutes away from getting bonded out. When news came in that the DNA found under Lydia's fingernails matched the DNA that they swabbed from him in Texas. Travis Forbes was indeed the person that had done this to Lydia. At midnight on July 12, 2011, Travis is booked back into Fort Collins jail for suspicion of attempted murder, R-word, and arson. August 6, 2011, Detective Gural goes back to speak with Travis about Kenya. To everyone's surprise, Travis tells him that he will tell him everything, and his only requests are that he is not labeled a offender, and the prosecution did not seek the penalty. They agreed, and Travis told him his entire version of accounts. Travis and his friend spotted Kenya outside of 24K Lounge talking to a homeless man. They asked her if she needs help, and she says that she needs a ride. They tried to get her a cab to her boyfriend's, but they couldn't find one. So he offered to get to give her a ride, and the three of them get into Travis's van. Travis drops his friend off first at his apartment, and during this time to the friend's apartment, Kenya passes out. So Travis pulls over, climbs on top of her in an attempt to R-word her. 
she wakes up and she begins fighting back. So that's when Travis, her to death. He placed her body in the cooler that he had in his van, duct taped it shut and put it in the freezer at Debbie's bakery until he was able to figure out what he was going to do with her. He decided to take her to Keensburg and put her in a shallow grave under a bunch of cottonwood trees. He then returned to the bakery where he cleaned his van with bleach and burned everything that Kenya had touched in the 55 gallon barrel. This is what the neighboring business owners had told police that they witnessed. On September 26, 2011, Travis pled guilty to first degree of Kenya and was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. He also pled guilty to the attempted murder of Lydia Tillman. Lydia actually prepared a statement for the trial and it reads as follows. Travis Forbes, you caused me no harm. My spirit, my soul, and my mind remain untouched. May you find peace in this life. It was my intention to find the strength in my heart to forgive you, Travis Forbes. I did. I felt extreme anger toward him. Then I felt sad for him. He must be in so much extreme pain to so brutally hurt another human. She's right. I don't know that I could forgive him. So she's probably a better human than I am. But she's right. Travis Forbes was sentenced to 48 years in prison to run consecutively to the life sentence that he received for Kenya. October 5th, 2011, Travis Forbes' girlfriend, Carrie Humphrey, was arrested and charged with attempting to influence a public official. She pled guilty to one count of attempting to influence a public official, one count of perjury, and two counts of false reporting to authorities. On September 14th, 2012, she was sentenced to 60 days in jail and four hours supervised probation. She was also ordered to serve 2,000 hours of community service and to seek mental health counseling. I'm glad that she paid some sort of price. I am. Because I feel like more times than not, they don't ever really get punished for, you know, these things so okay guys if you are still here thank you thank you thank you i appreciate you so very much i truly truly do if you have not liked subscribed or commented yet please consider doing so it really helps me out i really really appreciate it if you have suggestions please email me harding527 at yahoo.com as long as the information is on my side i'm pretty good about covering your cases for you guys and until next time, I love you all and be safe out there, please.